Hey, it's Pastor Alan Brumback. I just want to thank you for watching here at Central Church. And we pray that God uses His Word to help bless you to be a follower of Christ. You know, here at Central, we are all about making disciples. And we want to do it in a way that really impacts people here locally. And if you are watching from some other location, we want to encourage you to go and be plugged in to a local church where you are. We're so honored to have you. And if you're looking for a church home, we would love to have you at Central. Always remember, you're loved at Central. Matthew 28, verse 18. Let's stand as we read God's Word this morning. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. Uh, Jesus, the Bible says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now let's all read this last two verses together. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always until the end of the age. You may be seated. What's your favorite pizza? Some people love um, meat lover's pizza, but what's your favorite restaurant? Maybe Pizza Hut, Papa John's, Little Caesars, Pizza Pizza. Somebody said Mellow Mushroom. I like Domino's. I like Domino's. Now, 10 years ago, Domino's wasn't any good. They were pretty bad. As a matter of fact, they were so horrible and so bad that they decided as a company to do something that no other major business in America had ever done before. They were honest. George Orwell said that in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And so they launched about 10 years ago a nationwide campaign that told the truth about how bad their pizza really tasted. As a matter of fact, in their commercials, they posted what people had sent in comments about their pizza. One person said, this is the worst excuse for a pizza I've ever had. Another one said, it tasted like cardboard. It's bland. Another one said, it's void of flavor. But I think the worst one that really hurt Domino's the most is that someone said that Chuck E. Cheese's pizza tasted better. So they launched this nationwide campaign, and they talked about how that they were all about growing fast, but yet they didn't improve quality, and that they were going to do something to make it better. As a matter of fact, their CEO, Patrick Doyle, said that there comes a time when you need to make a change. And so they completely changed their pizza. They, for the first time in a long time, used what they called fresh ingredients, like real cheese, as opposed to fake cheese, right? They used real tomatoes. God only knows what they were using before. They're probably using spaghetti sauce. And then they put on the crust a herb, garlic, buttered crust, which is the best thing that Domino's has ever done. Amen? Since that campaign, what they call a transparency campaign, they, they, they actually exploded. They went from the worst pizza chain in, the, in America to the first. The, it's the, now the leading pizza chain with last year in 2019, actually a year before last, their sales were over $7 billion because they were honest and they were willing to make change. They were willing to challenge themselves to make a change. And the reason I'm telling you this is this, is that because of what we're seeing in our world and because of what we're even seeing in the church today, there is a transparency campaign that needs to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. Our mission as a church, as Central Church, is not to make pizzas, but to make disciples of all people. But in reality, so many churches just like ours have gotten caught up with so many things that we've done a great job at so many things. And I will tell you, Central is an awesome church. God has blessed us in these past few years in many, many ways. But I believe we've gotten so great at so many things that we've not been great at the one thing that matters the most, and that is making disciples that make disciples. Instead of making disciples, a lot of churches in America are faking disciples. And so this morning, we are going to start a march as a church to recommit ourselves to the great commission of Jesus Christ, to go into the world and to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that God has commanded us to teach them. That is what we are going to be, and that's what the Go and Go Central Church is all about. Now, we are reading in Matthew 28... 
And Matthew 28 is the resurrection story of Jesus. Jesus is presented in Matthew's gospel as the king. And here you see the resurrected king standing before his disciples in this resurrected body. And he gives them his commands to go and to make disciples of all the nations. Now, think about this. The resurrection of Jesus is proof that all authority is given to him. It is proof that he has all authority. And because Jesus has all authority, that should transform our priorities. See, if Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, then everything he tells us we should do, we should do. And everything he tells us we can do, we can do. And so this morning, I want to look at two things. One, the distractions that keep us from making disciples. And then I want to give you at the end three convictions that will sustain us in making disciples. So the first thing is the distractions that stop us. We didn't read this, but in verses 16 and 17, the Bible tells us that the 11 disciples went where Jesus had directed them. And the Bible says that in verse number 17, that when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. Imagine if Jesus showed up right now. What would would your response be? It would be to worship him, right? It wouldn't be just standing there like this. It would be to worship him. So these disciples saw Jesus resurrected, and they worshiped him. But then notice verse 17, it says, but some doubted. I think that this is one of the most encouraging but also revealing verses in the Bible. It's encouraging because if these guys could have some doubts after seeing everything that Jesus had done and hearing everything that Jesus had said, and still they see him high and resurrected in front of them, and they still had doubts about him, that gives me hope, right? That should give you hope. But it also shows us something else, and that is this. We are all prone to be dumb, <laughs> right? We're all prone to be dumb. Jesus, however, in the midst of their doubt and their maybe stupidity, appears to them, and he gives them a great commission. And the great commission, the central verb, is the verb to make disciples, to multiply disciples. Now, maybe you've gone to church all of your life, or maybe you've just showed up to church, this is your first Sunday. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, what is a disciple of Jesus? If Jesus says that what we're supposed to be doing with all of our lives as believers is to make disciples, then what is a disciple? And you know, many churches, maybe even myself, I know that I've come up with you need to make disciples, and you have no idea, we have no idea what a disciple is. So I want to give you a definition that our church staff has put together that we're going to be using for many, many, many months and years and to come of how do we define what a disciple is. So here's what a disciple is. Someone who follows Jesus in faith and lifestyle and desires to help others do the same. Someone who follows Jesus in faith and lifestyle and desires to help others do the same. Now, this call of Jesus as he ascends to the Father to go and make disciples of all nations actually has its roots in Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve, he blessed them. He he told them to be fruitful and to multiply and to cultivate the earth. He gave them what theologians call the creation mandate or woman date if you need that. (laughs) And they were to fill the earth with image bears. They were to have children, and those children were to have children. And each of those children was to walk with the Lord and to reflect the glory of God on the earth. But yet sin entered into the world. And through that, death has come. And not everyone is a, uh, a person who honors and fears God and glorifies God with their life. So here Jesus, as he ends, he continues that uh, creation mandate with a final and ultimate reiteration of that through the Great Commission. And Jesus says you are to go and not physically make children as much as you are to make disciples. Now, your children should be disciples of Jesus, but you are to do this until Jesus returns. And so making disciples is the original call of humanity, and it's the ultimate call of Christianity. To glorify God by making disciples of Jesus that reflect the glory of God on the earth. This is the call of every church. It is the call of every believer. As we gather as a church, we gather for the sole purpose so that we can come together to carry out the great commandment and the great commission together. The goal of our church and the goal of our lives should be to be obedient to the command to make disciples of all people. And yet, if we're honest, most of us are not involved in making disciples. I was sitting in a seminary class taught by Chuck Lawless 
And I will forget those harrowing words that he asked in 2006 in which he asked to that class, who are you discipling? And in that moment, I was sitting there, and here I was, supposed to be a God-fearing Christian. I was a pastor of a church, and I answered the call, I am discipling no one. And the question is, why? Why did I struggle then? And I'll be honest with you, since then, since 2006, I've not had a moment in my life where I'm not personally helping someone become a follower of Jesus in faith and in lifestyle. But what keeps us from making disciples? Well, I, I will say a few things. One is doubt. Doubt keeps us from making disciples. Now, probably everyone in the room would say, Pastor, I'm saved. I believe that Jesus is God, and I believe that he's living inside of me. And you worship Jesus here this morning in this room. But yet inside, maybe you have doubt. And what that doubt is, is that you doubt the power of the gospel. You doubt your ability to share the gospel, and you doubt that maybe it won't even work. You doubt that it actually has uh, the power to change. Because what happens is, is we see the brokenness of our world, we see broken people around us, and we doubt that we can make any difference at all. And many people share, do not share the gospel because they lack p- confidence in the power of the gospel to change anything. It is the doubt. See, even the disciples here worship Jesus, but some doubted. And maybe that's what's keeping you from making disciples, from living the life that God's called you to do. But not only doubt, but distractions. Distractions keep us from making disciples. We are the most distracted people probably in the history of humanity. I think that most Americans could probably have some form of ADHD. We're distracted by so many things. Distracted by things like television and social media and politics and sports and fitness and family and buying stuff on Amazon that we don't need, but yet we can get in two days at a good deal. We're distracted by so many things. We can also be distracted not only by the things of this world, but we can be distracted by good things or even church things and not make disciples. You know, most church members and most leaders that are involved in the things of the church are sadly often too busy running programs and too busy doing events and too busy getting ready for Sunday morning that we neglect to make disciples during the week. Now, this doesn't negate the fact that Sunday gatherings matter. Sunday morning gatherings matter. We are commanded to gather together, whether uh, now in this new world, uh, through uh, online or in person, we are commanded to gather together. But our mission as a church is not to gather an audience. Our mission as a church is to grow disciples Building an audience is not the same thing as making disciples, and so many churches have mistaken that. So many churches find their success in how many people they can get to show up on Sunday rather than how many people they can send out during the week to make disciples. But here's the truth that we have to come to grips with. In a post-COVID, post-Christian world, the weekend and Sunday morning is less effective for truly reaching people for Jesus. Most people, you think about this. Last Sunday, we had our services online. And so I, with my family, sat in the living room, and we watched the 930 service. And then at 11 o'clock, I had to go run an errand. And so I went out with my kids. And, you know, because we're here at 930 and 11, I don't really get to see all the heathens out in the road on Sunday. That's a joke. But it's amazing if you walk by, I'm even in my neighborhood, I'm driving out in my neighborhood and probably, there's probably 250 homes in my neighborhood and I kind of had to drive through my neighborhood and I would assume that 90% of the people in my neighborhood didn't go to church that morning. Now maybe they watched it online, I don't know. But you think about that, most people in the world, that church isn't on their radar. They don't think about, hey, I'm having a bunch of problems, I should go to church. Most people don't think that way. And so if we have this idea that if we have the biggest and best church, the biggest and best show, the biggest and best programs, that people are going to just show up, that's going to become less and less effective in a post-COVID world. Will Mancini in his book, Future Church, said this in his second chapter. He says, for years, churches have measured success through attendance, buildings, and cash. Most churches count nickels and noses for success. Now, here's what I want you to understand. People counting, having a, a people come to church and having a, a good a, a amount of money being given is, is not bad. It's not bad. I'm not saying stop coming and stop giving. If we did, we'd have to shut, up, shut the doors. But those things are, are helpful to move the mission forward. But they cannot be the goal in and of themselves. If the only goal of our church is to get the biggest crowd and to get the most money, we're not a church. That cannot be our goal. 
Those things are only input results that go into the disciple-making process with the result of making disciples. Money and people go into the factory of disciple-making and out should come making disciples. If all we're looking for is more money and more people, we should shut the doors and do something else. But sadly, and this is why a lot of people are turned off from the church. You know why people, I hear this all the time. I don't want to go to church. All they want is my money. Or all they want is me to do something. And the reason why is because functionally for a lot of people, the great commission in church is this, make more worshiper attenders, baptizing them in the name of small groups and teaching them to volunteer a few hours as I've commanded you. Now, why is it that so many churches and so many pastors focus on those things, on attendance and money? Because it's quicker to count. It's easier to do. And you can see results in less time. See, what most people want is they want quick results and they want them now. They want instant results. And the reason why a lot of pastors, I'm, I'm, listen, this is a very transparent message this morning. The reason a lot of pastors want, care about attendance numbers is because those attendance numbers somehow validate that they're actually making an, an impact. And the problem is, is that the church, and even our church, has got sucked into the attractional model of success, thinking that if we have the best show and the best programs, then we will grow. Well, Mancini in his book said this. He said, the scandal of our time is that we have made attendance the numerical byproduct of disciple-making into the proof of disciple-making, even though we may not be making disciples at all. You can have a church that runs 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, but that doesn't mean you're making disciples. It means you're good at gathering a crowd. Jesus did not say, go into the world, get people to show up to your church, and, you, and if you have a healthy bottom line, I'll be happy. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus didn't say, go and build a building and gather people in. He says, go make disciples. We use buildings to make disciples. We use buildings to gather together. We use these things. These aren't bad things, but they can't be the goal. See, what God wants each and every believer to do is to reproduce a real, authentic disciple follower of Jesus. Those who genuinely follow Jesus, who worship Jesus, who share the gospel, who grow in their faith, who serve others, who love and care for their family, their neighbors, and the nations. That's what we're called to do. But the problem is we're too stinking distracted. We're too, too stinking busy playing church, not being the church. And there are too many churches playing the church, and people are going to hell. But the church is playing. You say, well, Pastor, aren't we having a men's cornhole event? You know why we're doing that? Because we want to have men show up so that we can meet those men, get to build relationships with those men, so that we can get men in discipleship groups. Matter of fact, I'm starting a discipleship group this Thursday morning. You can show up at 7 o'clock at Cracker Barrel. You can buy your breakfast, and I'll tell you about Jesus. <laughs> show up. It goes virtual. We meet once a month at Cracker Barrel, and we're virtual, so you can get up, just roll out of bed, take the crust out of your eyes, and say amen, all right? Get on Zoom. If you can do Zoom, you can get online. But listen, we are called to make disciples, but here's what David Platt says in his book, Radical. He says, making disciples is messy. It's slow. It's tedious. It's even painful at times. It's all these things because it's relational. You know, everything's great except for people, right? But Jesus has not given us an effortless step-by-step -step formula for impacting nations for his glory. He's given us people. And he said, live for them, love them, serve them, and lead them. Lead them to follow me and lead them to lead others to follow me. And in the process, you will multiply the gospel to the ends of the earth. Here's the thing. I'm, I'm, this is, I got all the time in the world. Our church has a desire to plant churches, to, to, to reproduce congregations. A few years ago, we took on the venture of going downtown to plant a church. We sent 120 of our best and brightest. And three years later, it didn't work. It didn't work. And, I, and now look, it worked out in the sense that we sold the property and God blessed us financially. And now we're set up to plant churches. But here's what I've learned and here's what I'm, we're going to be doing as a church. I'm not going to plant churches to hope to make disciples. We got it backwards. 
if we make disciples, we'll plant churches. Does that make sense? But if we're too distracted trying to be the next whatever church and not be the church God's called us to be in making disciples, we'll never be what God's called us to be. So that's the distractions. And all of us are distracted. You might be distracted by so many things. Even right now while I'm preaching, how many distractions have we had? But there are some convictions that will sustain you. Now, if you're here and you're new to church, you're like, well, what is this all about? These next three things I'm going to give you, I believe if you are a follower of Jesus, these are going to help you. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, these are going to make you want to be a follower of Jesus. Because it's found in the Great Commission. Jesus here, as he is giving this Great Commission, gives three wonderful truths, three convictions that if we as a church, if you as an individual can just get a hold of, you will see that you can make disciples and you can live the life that God's called you to live and created you for. Three convictions are these. I'm going to give them to you first and we're going to walk through them. First conviction is this. God wants to use me. You've got to believe that. Number two, God has empowered me. And number three, God is with me. You see this in the text. Notice here in verse number 19. Actually, verse number 18, Jesus here is appearing to these 11. Who are these 11 people? Who are these people that Jesus here has called to gather together to meet him in this place in Galilee? Who, who is it that he is giving this great commission to do to change the world? Who are these 11? They were not the cultural elites. None of them had degrees from Yale or Harvard. None of them were a part of the intelligentsia. You know who they were? They were common fishermen. They were bums. They were hicks from the sticks. They were common, ordinary people who had been changed by Jesus. They were not technocrats or professionals. They were just common, ordinary people. And yet God used 11 common, ordinary men and a bunch of other women to change the world. You are coming this morning to church because of these 11 men. So what this teaches us is that making disciples is not just the job of the professionals or the varsity super Christians. God desires for all believers to go and be disciple makers. He, we see this in that first verb, go. Verse 19, go. It can be translated as you are going. In Jesus' mind, it is not if you go, but as you go. The implication is that all believers are going somewhere. Now, he didn't say go and beat somebody over the head with a Bible. He didn't say go and stand on a sidewalk and preach and proclaim. Not that those things are bad, but he didn't say that. He just says that wherever you go, go with the intention of making disciples. So you guys go places. You know, I go places, you go places. Now, maybe with COVID, you go less places. Some of you watching online, you say, I haven't gone anywhere. I haven't even gone outside. Go outside. Go outside. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Put gloves on. But go outside. But you go to school. You go to work. You go to the store. You go to the gym. You go to the, mark, the, the mall. I don't know why you go to the mall. But you go to the mall. You go to the park. You go to sporting events. You go everywhere in between. Go. And he says, as you're going, go with intentionality to make built, to make real relationships with people. And then in those relationships with people that you meet, point them to Jesus. He's not saying you have to be professional. You don't have to get a college degree to do this. You know, Francis Chan, who has a very difficult, or very way of, of saying something very difficult with, will make you smile your face or cry, says this in his book, Multiply. He says, somehow we have created a church culture where the paid ministers do the ministry and the rest of us just show up, put some money in the plate, and leave feeling inspired or fed. We have moved so far away from Jesus' command that many Christians don't have a frame of reference for what disciple-making looks like. When you think about this, I, I, this is an indictment on me. I've been here for 10 years. The only one I got to blame for the past 10 years is me. I can't pass the buck. I've not done a good enough job because I believe even myself in leadership style have just said, hey, just show up, pay up, and leave happy and tell others to come and do the same. 
But you have no idea what it means to make disciples. So in coming in these next few weeks and months, you're going to be hearing so many ways. And as we move out into the future, our church is going to be a church that makes disciples. But we want to teach you how to do it. Here's a cool thing. If you read the book of Acts, it's a dangerous book. Luke goes out of his way to show that the gospel tra- traveled farther and faster around the world through the mouths of regular Christians than the apostles and full-time Christian workers could get there. Stephen Neal, a church historian, said this. He says, nothing is more notable than the anonymity of those early missionaries in Acts. Luke does not turn aside to mention the name of a single one of those pioneers who laid the foundation. Notice this phrase, few if any of the great churches were really founded by the apostles. Peter and Paul may have organized the church in Rome, but they certainly didn't start it. You go out through church history, it's not the big names that plant churches. It's the nobodies. I mean, think about this. And I love the guy. How many churches did Billy Graham plant? None that we know of. Not many were saved, praise God. It's through ordinary people. And you don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to be college educated to make disciples. It's just one beggar telling another beggar where they found bread. All you have to know is that Jesus is alive. He's alive in your heart and you want to make him known. Two weeks ago, I was talking to uh, uh, some of our uh, people that we partner with in the Middle East. And and he was telling me, the, the, the personnel there was telling me about this guy that he knew that was in a very restricted country that moved to a less restricted country for a few weeks. And through that course of that time, he was a devout Muslim. And through the course of that time, he, inter- he interacted with a, a, a man that was a Christian. And that Christian man led him to faith in Jesus Christ. And so for about two or three weeks, this guy who just met this other guy spent every day with this guy pouring into him about the gospel, how to share the gospel. And this guy who had fled this very restricted country to come to a less restricted country decided that God is calling him to go back to his restricted country. Think about that. And so he says that he found out that this guy, as he went back to his restricted country, was put in prison for sharing Jesus. And they got word somehow that, that from the guy who was in prison, and here's what he said. He was in isolation. This guy was put in isolation, but somehow, way, they got this word out. And here's what the guy said. I can't wait to get out and make Jesus' name known. Jesus has given me a fresh new life, and it's worth sharing. That guy wasn't a professional. He didn't have time to go to seminary. You know what he was? He was a nobody telling everybody about somebody who will save anybody. He was just a Christian. You say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. And here's the thing. God wants to use you, but he doesn't need you. It's not like God said, man, I hope they decide to make disciples. I really do need them. Gabriel, boy, we need them. No. If if you're not willing, he'll find somebody else. But here's the question. Are you even a disciple of Jesus if you're not making disciples? Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, you are either a missionary or you are an imposter. Here's the truth. If we're going to see a true kingdom advance in Sanford, in Central Florida, in the state, in the nation, in the nations, it will not be through a huge event. It will not be through a gifted pastor. It will be ordinary people who are making disciples of Jesus Christ. God wants to use you. And he wants to use me. Number two, God has empowered me. Verse 18, all authority has been given to me. Jesus died on the cross, complete obedience to the Father, rose from the dead, and God gave him the prerogative, the right, and the permission and authority over all things. Jesus says, because I have all authority, I am authorizing you. I have all authority, so I am authorizing you to make disciples, and you make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by teaching in my name. Jesus says, I am sending you out in my authority. Who sent us? Jesus did. Somebody ask you, who sent you? You say, Jesus sent me. Now, here's something else. In Luke 24, which is a, a parallel passage, as Jesus here is commanding them, He gave his disciples another command right after he gave the Great Commission, and that was this, is for them to wait. He says, says, behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, 
but stay in the city and be clo- until you're clothed with power from on high. Jesus says, listen, I want you to go to the nations, but before you go to the nations, I want you to go and do nothing. And some people are still obeying that command to this day. <laughs> go and do nothing and wait. The great theologian Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. What were they waiting for? It wasn't what they were waiting for. It was who they were waiting for. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And so in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. Jesus says, I want you to wait until the power shows up. Who's the power? The Holy Spirit. The question is this, why did Jesus make them wait 10 days? Have you ever had to wait for something for 10 days, but you didn't know what it was? You know, some of you had to go through quarantine. I had to go through a little bit of that because I was exposed. And I've gone on the other side of that, two negative tests. I promise I won't sneeze on you. But 10 days is a long time to wait. Jesus gave them a, a task to go around the world. And be, he said, before you go, wait. Wait. They didn't know how long. He just said, wait. Why did God, why did Jesus make them wait? Why didn't he just give them the Holy Spirit then? Here's why. This is a big point. It was to show them and to show us that the Great Commission is not something that we could accomplish for Jesus. It was to show us that it's something that Jesus must accomplish through us. Because the Holy Spirit is Christ in the Christian. And Jesus said, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. See, the power to fulfill the Great Commission is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts people. The Holy Spirit is the one who convinces people of their need for Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who transforms their broken lives and who makes them authentic disciples of Jesus. Not you. I've told this to people before. If I've saved you, you're going to hell. If Jesus saves you, you're saved. See, apart from the Holy Spirit working in and through us, we are powerless to accomplish the task of making disciples. It is not how many books we read or conferences we attend or strategies we implement, but it's by the time we spend in God's Word and in prayer that the Spirit's power and work comes and is manifested in our lives and families and church. How many of you want the Holy Spirit to move in power in your life? I do. You know, some Baptists are scared of the Holy Spirit. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God has given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power. But so many of us are not connected. Bono said that religion is what happens when the spirit has left the building. It's been said that if the Holy Spirit left your church, would anybody notice? I'm afraid that for many people in many churches, we've been relying too much on our own ingenuity and techniques and strength rather than the Holy Spirit's. But Zechariah says, that old prophet, he says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so if you say, I can't do it, pastor, I can't do it. Here's the thing, can't never could do nothing. But you have no excuse. If you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. And the same Holy Spirit that was in Peter, that was in Paul, That was in Charles Haddon Spurgeon and Billy Graham is the same Holy Spirit inside of you. But here's even further. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus' ministry and raised Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit inside of you. You've got it. You've got everything you need. You just don't use what you got. It's like that guy said, I got all the patience I need. I just don't use any that I got. And so we can have confidence that the mission will succeed because Jesus, listen, Jesus is not in heaven hoping that we'll do a really good job down here so things will work out. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And he, therefore, because of that, will and can ensure that salvation will spread over the entire world because he's given us everything we need to do what he's called us to do. God wants to use me. God has empowered me. Number three, God is with me. It's the promise at the end. If you think about this, if, if without this promise, it would be tough. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is Jesus' mission that he's just empowered us to do. And he's called us to do. But the good news, he's with us in doing it. The Holy Spirit is Jesus inside of us. 
Because Jesus is the one who's building this church. And listen, if we know that Jesus is with us, and if we know that Jesus is for us, and if, if we know that, that he's not against us, then we can trust him to go to difficult places, to hard places, and dangerous places. Because he's with us. The one who's with you is greater than anyone who would ever pick on you. John Stott said his authority on earth allows us to dare to go to all places. His authority in heaven gives us our only hope of success. And his presence with us gives us no other choice. Because I know that Jesus is with me, I can go anywhere he leads. He pro- Did you know that he promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone? If you've ever experienced loneliness, you know, I know that some of you have. Some of you, I've talked to some even in the past week, just so lonely. If you've ever experienced loneliness, and you want to experience God's presence, you will truly feel His presence in your life when you're obedient to making disciples of all nations, because He's promised it. I've had some people say, Pastor, I don't feel God in my life. I just don't feel Him. Could it be it's because you're not following and obeying Jesus? Could it be that the reason why you don't have joy in your life and that you don't experience his presence in your life and that you struggle worshiping him and that you don't feel him is because you're disobedient to him? You know what I found with my kids? When they're disobedient and caught, it's hard to catch them. (laughs) They don't want to necessarily be in my presence. But when they're in obedience, they want to be in my presence. I want to be in theirs. Listen, maybe the reason that you're not experiencing the presence of God in your life is because you're not obedient to the call. I've spoken to a lot of people this week and around the world that are on the very tip of the spear in the gospel advance, and they're in very difficult, dangerous places, and all of them to the person, because I asked them, have all testified that the presence of Jesus in their life is what's given them the strength to continue. We have a partnership in the Middle East to, with a, a group of people that are on the, in the, the, the very regions uh, of danger, where ISIS is still real, where people are in refugee camps who've been living there for years. And it's hard. In the summer, it gets over 120 degrees. In the winter, the day can go from 70 degrees to, to 30 degrees. It, it, it could snow, it's crazy. I talked to him this week, and I asked him, I said, how can you keep going? How do you keep going? And here's what he said. He said that knowing that Jesus will never leave me and is always with and for me and not against me gives me the peace and the confidence and the direction to keep going no matter what this broken world throws at us. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm about to end, so you all can be happy in a second. I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be tough. This world's not going to get any better. Whatever illusion you had of making anything great again, it ain't. Only Jesus can make things great again. Persecution is coming. I'm telling you right now, in the next four to eight years, persecution is coming. I believe in the next year, some of the things that I have been saying from the pulpit will be illegal. It's happening, folks. It's happening, and it's happening, and we've watched it happen, and we've done nothing. I'm telling you. It's going to get hard. People aren't just going to, it's going to, and I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. Man, I want a warm fuzzy. This ain't a warm fuzzy sermon. Sorry. It's going to get hard. Real Christians are going to come out. And the ones playing are going to fall off. But if you're a real Christian and you want to make it through the tough times, it's going to be with Jesus with you. I need Jesus with me. He's promised to be with me, right? We're going to be talking about this for weeks to come, these three convictions. God wants to use me. God has empowered me. And God is with me. Do you want to make a difference? You can. You can make a difference. Just this week we saw a man by the name of Eugene Goodman, the police officer for Capitol Hill, he stood between the mob and the Senate chambers, And there's that picture of him, that famous picture of him standing there in front and keeping the intruders out and redirecting them a different way. He's been called a hero. 
You may disagree with that, but I'm going to tell you, I believe with everything that I've read, that man's a hero. And when I saw that picture, when I saw what happened, I wrote this down and I said, all it takes is one person with courage and conviction to make a huge difference. Do you know God wants to use you to make a difference? He wants you to change your life. He wants you to serve him. He wants to empower you. He has empowered you. He is with you. How do I know he's with me? How do I know he's with me? Because Jesus stood between me and the wrath of God. He took the wrath I deserved so I can get the forgiveness I don't deserve. He took the pain. I get the joy. He took the nails. I get heaven. He took my problems and I got his peace. He stood tall for me and he's calling us to stand tall for him. Hey, this is Pastor Allen again. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, uh, being uh, online is great. Watching services online is awesome. But there's no substitute for being involved in a local church. So I want to pray that you will be involved in a local church. And if you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at Central. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.